probably give it a couple minutes just to let everybody uh, join who would like to and needs to. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I'm showing we're live. So uh, before you start, uh, Trent, give me a countdown and I'll hit record. Okay. And, uh, let me know. Brett, do you have anything else to get out of your system? Good. No. Okay. All right, we're good. All righty. Welcome, everybody, to uh, Orange County Gun Owners, uh, how to get your CCW seminar. Uh, so what we're going to go over tonight is the, uh, you know, the OCSD process for getting a permit for Orange County residents. Um, in addition to obviously all you guys that are joining from the lobby, uh, I have with me Brett Roberts with uh, Apex Defensive Strategies, who's uh, one of our uh, CCW instructors, and then uh, Ernie Medina from Tap Rack Bang Training. So if you guys, Brett, would like to introduce yourself. Yeah, Brett Roberts. Uh... Apex Defense Strategy. I've uh, been with the uh, OCGO for what four years now, so it's a little bit after its inauguration. Um, and uh, yeah, just uh, here to help out. Awesome. Ernie? Uh, hi, I'm Ernie Medina with uh, TRB, um, one of the CCW training providers here in Orange County. I've uh, been working with uh, Orange County Sheriffs for a couple years now in the CCW space. Uh, and uh, just here to, to help out and, and provide uh, assistance where needed. Awesome. Um, so what we're going to cover tonight are uh, some of the common questions uh, that are out there. So I'm going to, in a minute here, I'm going to share my screen with the uh, OCSD website and kind of uh, direct people through the process. Um, OCSD uses a program, a third party program called uh, Permidium. And so what this does is this essentially inputs uh, the applicant's information into the Cal DOJ uh, CCW application. So uh, for those of you guys that haven't seen it before, uh, give me a second here. Um, this is the actual application uh, that when you're in Permidium, you're filling out. Uh, so this is the California DOJ Bureau of Firearms standard initial and renewal application for license. Uh, so this is a standard one across the board in California. Um, so once you have submitted your application through Permidium, you essentially have a populated form uh, of this. So this is about, memory serves about 13 pages uh, of all of your, you know, applicant personal information, clearance, background check, all that, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so as a lot of you guys know, um, the uh, CCW process in California is uh, is county by county. So the chief law enforcement officer of a county, typically the sheriff's department, obviously, um, determines what their good cause uh, is going to be. And we're going to talk about this uh, in detail. Uh, so what L.A. sheriffs uh, with uh, dear sheriff uh, Villanueva determines to be a good cause and what uh, our sheriff, uh, Sheriff Don Barnes, determines to be a good cause are two very different things. Um, so Orange County, um, you know, you're, you're issued a permit through the county, but it is a permit that is valid statewide and it's valid in a number of other states, too. Um, so once you have your permit in, in OC, you can carry throughout the state. It's just, just subject to uh, the restrictions that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. So um, what we have here uh, is OCSD's uh, CCW license homepage. So as you can see, uh, through throughout COVID, um, initially OCSD had, had sent out a closure notice. But uh, after about a week and a half, we got, we got some answers back from them. Uh, it turns out the closure notice had, just was the... Uh, facility itself. So they weren't doing in-person interviews. So um, we've had a number of students go through video interviews, go through, um, you know, get phone calls about the renewal process and things like that. Ernie, have you had uh, quite a few guys going through uh, while this has been going on? Yeah, actually, we've had uh, quite a bit of uh, new applicants and renewing applicants. Uh, renewing applicants, uh, they really didn't skip a beat. They were just uh, issuing the renewals via mail. Um, and then the uh, new applicants, what they've been doing, at least for the time being, is they're doing um, Zoom or some kind of uh, virtual uh, interviews with the uh, sheriff's department. So they're actually conducting the interviews uh, as we speak at this time. Awesome. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I've actually heard from quite a few of our students, renewals were being processed very rapidly, um, you know, within, you know, a week or two, which 
you know, six months ago, things were kind of starting to slow down because, you know, the number of the initial, uh, the initial people, oops, sorry, actually I muted myself for a second. Um, <laughs> the, uh, as the initial flux of people who first got their permits back in, you know, about 2014, 2015, you know, and then every two years, there's that whole group comes through again, in addition with everybody else that's come through at the same time. So, um, you know, things were definitely starting to slow down, but it looks like uh, Permidium and, and the Sheriff's Department staff and things have kind of caught up with a lot of the, uh, a lot of backlog, which has been awesome. So uh, just so everybody's clear, OCSD is continuing to issue both new and uh, renewal uh, applications. They are handling uh, both. Okay, uh, so basically what you do is um, you're on the home page and we're going to talk about these required documents here in a minute. Uh, these, this is just actually the best place to uh, where it's legible. Um, essentially, you generally for a two year permit, you have to be a resident of Orange County. Um, so you have to have proof of residency, at least two of the following documents showing your current address. So typically utility bill, lease or rental agreement, telephone bill, tax bill, um, vehicle registrations, things like that. Something that shows you do actually live here. Um, and then there is a, uh, a 90 day permit for people that apply for a permit through Orange County that are coming from out of the county. So it's essentially a temporary business um, or for the purposes of business CCW permit. Um, you'll need your detailed good cost statement. We're gonna spend quite a bit of time on this. Um, if you are an out of state resident, but you're here on orders, so active military and stuff like that, you'll need uh, orders, things like that, showing that you are uh, from this, uh, or you are currently stationed here living in Orange County. Um, so we're going to talk about the additional documentation and the kinds of things that that is uh, is referring to. Okay. So this is the actual permitium site here. Um, so as you can see, you've got your initial licensing fees. Uh, this judicial permit. This is for people who are uh, you know court staff, um, judges, uh, people like that that are working in the court system. So they get a three year permit, but the fees for everybody are pretty much uh, pretty much the same. Um, so a big problem that they've had since kind of day one is that, uh, people try to run their credit card through the system. Um, it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. Uh, so the sheriff's department has been taking payment information over the phone by credit card. Uh, they've been taking checks, uh, money orders, you know, the, the other kinds of, you know, distance payment has been fine. Um, but anywhere that it says you can process a payment in here, it's going to get reversed. <laughs> so just so, just so you know, uh, on that. Um, Ernie, do you have something on that? No, no. Oh, okay. uh, it doesn't know. Um, so the application requirements are all pretty straightforward. Uh, eligibility requirements, all of this pretty much matches what's uh, what's on the Sheriff's Department homepage. So for most people, you're going to start with the new concealed carry weapon license. So I'm writing that slows down substantially um, when uh, when I'm trying to run Zoom and the and the browser at the same time. Uh, so the best piece of advice we can give you uh, concerns all of your documentation. So what you should have ahead of time. So Ernie, if you want to launch into that real quick. Sure. As far as documentation is what you need to have. Uh, one, as he said, you need the, to have the, uh, the utility bills. Uh, if you've done your training already, certainly have your training certificate. Um, and then if you're married, uh, then they're going to want a copy of a marriage certificate uh, as well. If you're using, um, say you carry large sums of cash or money, uh, then they're gonna wanna see bank deposits or bank statements to, to back that up. Um, and then as far as the good cause statement, uh, you're gonna wanna have that. Now, uh, what I always recommend to folks when they're going through this, this system, before you venture off into uh, filling out the fields, which is after you agree to everything on this on a screen, once you get into the po point where you fill out the fields, uh, you want to have all the, the required documents uh, um, set aside, perhaps on your desktop, uh, in PDF format. So scan them in, nice copies, PDF format to include your good cause statement. Uh, and then also have a, uh, a word copy of your good cause statement handy, because there will be a point in the fields of the application where it's going to ask you for your good cause. It seems kind of redundant. Uh, but all you'll do is you'll take the good cause verbiage that's in the Word document, copy, paste, and then you're, you're off to the races. Uh, so good to have all the, the documents in PDF format prior to actually filling out the fields so you don't um, either lose what you have in the field or take forever going through it. Awesome. Um, so your first, um, 
your first statements you got to go through. It's implying uh, if applying for a new concealed carry weapon license uh, prior to issuance, completion of an eight to sixteen hour firearm training course is required. Now, a lot of the other places on the application say minimum sixteen hours. Some some say maximum sixteen hours. Um, the state penal code says that the training course is not to exceed uh, sixteen hours. That 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 a county can't require you to take a course longer than 16 hours is essentially what that, what that entails. Um, obviously, you know, there's one day courses out there that are great. There's two day courses that are out there that are great. You know, we recommend obviously getting trained, getting as much training as you can, you know, getting it, it, getting as, as comprehensive of training as you can get. So you understand the, the, the laws, the legalities, the, the do's and don'ts, the, the tactical considerations, the legal considerations, er everything that goes into it. Um, so, Essentially, a new course, you're going to need a full training, or a new permit, excuse me, you're going to need a full training course. For a renewal course, uh, there's a four-hour course. So most training providers will offer an initial course that's eight to 16 hours, and then a renewal course that is four hours. Uh, and some trainers offer them concurrently, like I know, Ernie, you're, you're one of those guys that allows people to do shooting stuff at the same time, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Sure. Um, so, and then obviously, if you're applying for a modification, uh, we'll talk about that. It's very, very, very simple. Um, that's just adjusting an existing permit to add or remove uh, a firearm. Now, one of the things I want to note on here um, is when it comes to guns that you want on your permit, can everybody see this part I'm highlighting here? I know some of you guys might be on phones. Can everybody still see the screen I'm sharing? Yes. Okay, good, just making sure, thank you. Um, be sure that the firearm you are listing on your license is registered to you. This is one of the most common things that bounces back on people is Maybe they bought a gun 20 years ago. Maybe it's something that their, their father gave to them, their, their mother gave to them, you know, their, their kids gave to them as, as, a, as a gift. There's plenty of ways that somebody can lawfully obtain a firearm without it necessarily having been registered to them in the state of California. Um, so make sure that a gun that is going on your permit is one that is registered to you. Uh, so there's a couple of ways you can go about finding that out. Uh, you can get what's called an AFS automatic firearm system report. Uh, on yourself, uh, it takes forever, averages like three to four months um, to see what guns are registered to you. Um, and it's always kind of an entertaining experience. You'll find guns that you know you legally sold and transferred through a dealer three years ago that are still somehow registered to you because Bureau of Firearms is really caught up sometimes. Um, but you want to make sure the gun's registered to you. Um, if in doubt, you know, if you did an intrafamilial transfer, you can still submit a form to, to Cal DOJ to get that gun registered in your name. But this is one of the big ones because uh, OCSD will run that serial number. If it's not coming back to you, they're going to let you know, hey, you can't put this gun on your permit. Um, this uh, spouse domestic partner, this is actually a recent development uh, that uh, back in, I believe, January or February, uh, they allowed guns that were owned by spouses to be registered on the permit. However, we've gotten kind of mixed reports uh, from students, and we haven't gotten clearance from the Sheriff's Department, that um, you can't have the same gun registered on two permits. So that's something we've, we've seen kind of go back and forth during which gun. You can. Um, so, yeah. Okay. yeah, so the directive that came out from, from Orange County Sheriff's is, is that, let's just say, husband owns uh, the firearm, wife also has a CCW and she wants to put it on her card, uh, she can uh, put that on her car. So you can have one firearm existing on two different permits. That was the whole intent. Really? The whole okay. Intent behind, yeah, the whole intent behind that was, was to say, if for instance, let's just say, you know, you have an MP shield in the household and you didn't want to have two identical MP shields and one day the husband wants to carry it and the next day the wife wants to carry it, it's, it's silly to make them buy two different guns uh, or two guns of the uh, same make model. So the whole point was wife and husband can share the particular fire. That was the intent behind it. Okay. So we, we've had a couple of students come back and say they wouldn't allow it. So it may have been for another reason that, that something got bounced back. I, it wasn't something we verified, you know, but, but yeah, so that's good to, good to know because if memory serves, when we had the sheriff's debate, uh, that was actually something that uh, Sheriff Barnes, uh, when he was still you know, running, uh, we had Barnes and Harrington uh, debating over at uh, JT Schmidt. That was actually one thing that he brought up is that, yeah, you really shouldn't be limited to three guns. You shouldn't be limited to, you know, if you both have access to a gun, that was actually something that he brought up. So it's, it's good to see that that's gone through for that purpose. Hey, awesome. real quick, real quick. Yeah. If, if somebody does have a problem, contact Orange County Gun Owners and Trent and I will uh, do everything we can to, uh, to, communicate that with the sheriff's department, see if we can get that smoothed over. Absolutely, absolutely.
Um, so you'll go through a lot of these statements have to do with um, both the terms of your license and agreements that are already on that uh, on that Bureau of Firearms application. Um, so that you assume all responsibility, liability. Obviously, if you're carrying a gun, you do something with that gun. That's not the sheriff's department's problem. That's your problem, right? And I think we all kind of understand that. Um, they, this ter- third statement is saying that essentially, you know, just by applying and just by them receiving your application doesn't guarantee they're going to issue you a permit. Um, however, it should be said that OCSD has approved on average about 98% of applicants. And the ones that I know of who have gotten denied, it's because they left something out of their application. So in some cases, it was, you know, a misdemeanor from four or five years ago. Well, the same misdemeanor that somebody else put on their application, they got approved because it was in the past, it was whatever, you know, it was something minor, or even if it was something major, it was enough far enough back that the sheriff's department didn't make an issue out of it. Um, but if you don't bring it up, they're absolutely going to find it. You know, they're, they're going to go through your, back, your background, fine tooth film, they're going to find everything. Uh, so make sure that, you know, you are upfront about stuff, you know, leaving information out there is a really good way to get denied. Uh, and there have been some other denials on people who actually weren't allowed to have firearms that applied for a CCW permit and had a firearm and then got charged with a felony. So uh, it should go without saying that if you're not supposed to have a gun, you really shouldn't be applying in this process. Um, the license liability clauses, clauses conditions, restrictions, uh, pretty straightforward. I highly recommend that even if you're doing the permitting and process that you do take a minute and read through that, that Bureau of Firearms application to see what you are actually filling out. Um, not that this permitting is a bad thing, but you do want to make sure you are up to date on, on the actual document that you're submitting here. Uh, and again, that's Bureau of Firearms document 4012. Uh, I know it's probably hard to see right here, but that is the document number. You can get that from Cal DOJ's website. It's out there, uh, very readily available. Um, the penal code applications, uh, your CCW instructor should cover this. So essentially what constitutes homicide, what constitutes manslaughter, what constitutes brandishing. Uh, Each one of these penal code items are things that you need to understand. The onus of responsibility is on you. Um, Whoever you train with, you can't exactly be in a courtroom and go, oh, well, I didn't know that. By having a permit, by carrying a firearm out in public, you're accepting the responsibility that you do know what you're doing, that you are doing it in in full knowledge. Firearms proven categories, uh, these are ones that, again, you're, depending on the the state law changes or federal law changes, uh, there may be any number of reasons of of laws that happen above OCSD's pay grade that would essentially invalidate your permit, Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, If the state imposes more uh, restrictions and things like that, you know, if your permit isn't uh, up to date on those restrictions, then you'll either have to take, you know, some kind of uh, updated class or something like that. This is something that counties have done in the past. Uh, and then obviously you're giving permission to say that the agency can do a background investigation on you. Uh, this is one where people kind of get concerned uh, when it comes to uh, contacting employers, contacting neighbors and things like that. Um, you know, used to be the, the sheriff's department would check residencies every single time uh, with personnel way back at the beginning. Doesn't really happen quite as much anymore, but uh, there were situations where officers were asking neighbors, hey, does this person live here? Okay, great, no harm, no foul. And then sometimes people were saying, oh, well, because they're applying for a CCW permit. Well, keep in mind that information might get out if they contact your employer. Uh, It isn't a reason not to apply, uh, and the sheriff's department really isn't supposed to do stuff like that, but mistakes do happen, you know, everybody's human. So keep that in mind, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about your good cause and we talk about you know, if your employment is part of your good cause statement, what that might entail, okay? Uh, these are the terms of your license. Again, your CCW instructor should, um, should keep you up to date on all this kind of stuff. If you have never seen this document before and you currently have a permit, go to the sheriff's website and download it. It's right here, terms of license, okay? Um, these, are, these are the do's and don'ts. These are the where you can and where you can't. Um, and what, you know, how everything needs to go. Uh, This is kind of the big one right here. Uh, If contacted by a law enforcement officer for any reason, and the license holder is currently armed, meaning you are in possession of your gun and your permit, you are required to divulge that information to the law enforcement officer, okay? Now, what a lot of people don't kind of get, uh, get lost in the weeds on is what actually is a law enforcement contact and what isn't. So, Ernie, you wanna take that away? 
Sure. Um, so law enforcement contact is uh, any contact where the, the officer uh, is in incapacity of their job. So if you're standing in line at Dunkin' Donuts because you would never go to Starbucks um, and you exchange personal greetings with the, with the officer, that is not official contact. Um, and actually, if you, you say, hey, oh, by the way, I'm carrying, guess what? You just made it official contact and you took that officer from getting his coffee to dealing with you. Um, if say the cop pulls you over, uh, then yeah, that's, that's official contact. If you're on the street and they say, Hey, excuse me, sir, ma'am, uh, I need to speak with you also official contact, but something as simple as how you doing or, or whatever, uh, has nothing to do with their official capacity in that way does not constitute official contact. And we get a lot of questions, uh, about that. We provide, uh, such examples that I just gave you. Yeah, it's, it, you know, a good rule of thumb is, you know, if you're, if you're asked for ID, you know, that's, that's usually a good, good idea that you're being contacted for an official reason. So, you know, the biggest one is, is car stops. You know, that, that's where people get pulled over. Somebody wasn't paying attention to you, got a brake light out or who knows what the deal is. So, um, Brett, you want to go over what you should do with that car stop? Sure. Uh, at any time you are pulled over and, um, or an, at any time, for whatever reason, um, obviously keep your hands in plain sight and immediately, you know, the officer's going to come up and address you. You might be, you might be kind, you may not, but just, just be calm, cool and collect and just say, officer, just want to let you know, I am a concealed carry holder and I have my weapon on me and it is located X, Y, and Z. If it's on your body, you got to keep your hands on the steering wheel or, or, or palms up so you can see your fingers. Um, if it's, if you know, if it's, on your right hip and your ID is also in your right pocket, you're going to want to let, let them know that your weapon is on my right, right hip and my ID is in my right pocket. Um, you want to let, you want to make sure the officer feels safe around you. Nine times out of 10, the cop's going to be cool. If you're cool. Um, once they realize you have a CCW, once you tell them you have one and God forbid, if you lie that you have one and you don't have one, then you're a whole world of trouble. But once you actually, uh, once the officer knows that you have a CCW, chances are he's going to be really cool with you because you've passed background checks. You've gone through the scrutiny of, of this whole entire process to get a CCW. So they're going to probably feel a little more relaxed about you because you can't be a criminal or you shouldn't be a criminal and carrying a gun um, with CCW license. So just know that once you just divulge that information, chances are that cop's going to be like, all right, cool, no worries, uh, you know, um, Grab your ID. Don't reach for your gun. Don't make any sudden movements. You know, or you know, you leave your gun. I've had, I had pulled over, got pulled over by a highway patrolman coming from Arizona to California, um, in California, and highway patrolman says, "Hey, as long as your gun stays in your holster, my gun will stay in my holster." Simple as that. Um, in LA, uh, got pulled over there. Cops are like, "Don't even worry about it. Have a nice day." So, just be cool. Um, explain yourself. Um, if you get one of those. Uh, you get a cop's a little bit kind of a high strong, let him be high strong and just, just stay cool and say, I'm not going to make any moves until you tell me to. And if he wants to uh, ask you to step out of the car and, and detain your, your weapon, let him. That's his, it's his right to do that. And some, some officers will, but just, just stay cool. Nothing's going to happen unless you act like inappropriately. Yeah. And that is something a lot of people don't want to accept, I guess, or have, have issue with, you know, understand that if the officer does want to relieve your firearm during that stop, he, he has, there is legal authority behind that. He has the right to do so. Um, you know, if everything's fine, you know, it, again, generally most departments, you know, they're not, they're not going to do that unless there's a very specific reason for that stop, like the suspect you of driving under the influence or something along those lines. Um, if they think some other kind of major issue is going on, but yeah, it, you know, if you were speeding or you ran a yellow that happened to change shades at the last second or something like that, you know, probably not going to be an issue but understand that if they do uh if they do ask you to step out of the vehicle and and they take your gun that's what they're going to do okay um but yeah again if anything goes sideways you know just stay cool stay calm like brett said and handle it after the fact okay um so again take a minute uh especially you know even you guys that, that have permits always kind of go back and review the terms of license they actually were recently updated by the way back in february of this year uh, so make sure you're kind of up to date on on everything that's on here. Uh, expectations of conduct, uh, restrictions by act, specifically the do's and don'ts of where you can and cannot carry. This 
is the kind of document to refer to, not Facebook comments, not some of the, the popular pages out there, because even some of the CCW pages on Facebook and things like that, you know, most of us are members of quite a few of them. They may not realize they're giving out poor information, you know, because what the terms are in Riverside or in Contra Costa or in Ventura are not necessarily the same terms as are here. And the, the state does uh, devolve a lot of their authority to make different policies to the counties. OK. Um, so you move through this. Uh, what you're going to be applying for for most people is going to be a standard two year license. And then this will take you to the big page. So this is all of your application now. One of the biggest things we want to tell you, you cannot save this and go back out of it. <laughs> okay. A lot of, a lot of students that's been a complaint since Permidium started is that they would put all their information in and put their email in and all this stuff. And then they'd hit the back button or try it and they'd come back and it would be gone. Okay. So uh, this is why Ernie said, make sure you have all of your documentation, all of your information, everything put together at a time. Um, so birth uh, information, uh, so let me start at the top. So obviously applicant information, social security number, pretty straightforward. Um, US citizenship, military status, demographic information, uh, height, weight, hair, eye color, all that kind of stuff. Physical description, you can say, you know, super buff or, you know, whatever you want to stick in there. What you got, Brad? Uh, on that part, make sure you, you actually copy what's on your driver's license with the exception of the weight. There have been people who uh, have altering contact lenses that change their color of eyes and they put their color of eyes they wish they had not what they really had and the, you'll get questioned on that they, they will check pretty much everything so if you have hair put your color down if you have green eyes put green eyes if you have brown eyes plain green eyes don't put the plain green eyes down just yep. don't don't mix and match information um your telephone number Absolutely do the updates via text message. Uh, this has gotten better and better over the years since permitting was implemented, but the Sheriff's Department has been doing a lot of updates over text, especially in these last couple months. So this is one of the best ways because unfortunately they're, you know, they're getting all kinds of emails every day. Hey, where's my, where am I, where's my, you know, process at, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, sign up for the text message updates. They are, they're very, very helpful. Um, driver's license information, email, password, so that you can log back into the order once it's complete. Uh, your residence address, obviously all this information has to match um, the residency documents you are submitting. Uh, so make sure everything is correct. Um, time at present address. So just so everybody knows to be an Orange County resident, you have to have resided in the county for at least six months. Okay, there are some extenuating circumstances, but generally speaking, that's the rule of thumb is you had to have been here for at least six months. Um, and then all of your information here, residency of Orange County, duration in Orange County, duration in California. Uh, and then previous addresses within the last five years, this is not stuff you have to necessarily verify, but make sure you have all these addresses down. So this is again, why we're going through this um, is so that you make sure you have all this stuff ahead of time so that when you get to this page, you can just fill all of it out in one go. Brett, what you got? Yeah, and scroll back up to the, the pr uh, primary residence. So a lot of folks will ask me um, or have asked in the past, well, can I use my parents' address? You know, I live in LA County, but they live in, I live in Orange County. Absolutely not. They will, this is one part that they will research and they'll research it a lot more thorough than they'll let you know. And I'm not talking about just knocking on, door, on your neighbor's doors. They'll make sure you, you, they'll check your credit, which credit, which will give them every address that's listed on there. They'll check with your employer, what address is listed with there. They're going to find out if you are trying to, BS them or not. And if they find out that you are, you're done. That application is over and you can't reapply for probably three years, if that. So don't be slick and say, oh, you know, I live in LA County, but I got my, my aunt's house in, in Orange County. It's not going to work. Yep. Um, so thank you for that. Cause that actually reminded me of something else. Keep in mind, if you do mess something up and you do end up getting denied, what's the downside of that? You have to report every time you apply for a permit, whether or not you've been denied in California in the past. Now, they're going to check and see why you were denied, obviously. But, you know, if it was for something dumb like that, you know, to us, it's like, oh, well, I put the wrong address in there. Well, to them, it's like, well, why were you trying to hide your address? Why were you claiming you lived somewhere that you didn't? You know, why were you trying to kind of work around the system? Again, you know, honesty is kind of the best policy on this stuff. So, Make sure you have all this stuff ahead of time. Uh, same thing with the weapons you want on your license. Uh, so whether or not these are registered to you, registered to your spouse, 
make sure you have all those guns kind of ready to go. Uh, record the serial numbers. I strongly recommend you have someone else check your serial numbers. Twos that look like Zs or a zero instead of an O. This is where probably the majority of just really simple and time consuming errors occur. Uh, now, again, the Sheriff's Department is pretty understanding about this kind of stuff. This will not lead to a denial, but they're going to go, hey, you gave us this serial number. Something's not right here. Uh, one of the most common issues that I saw on this for years were uh, Glocks. Um, Glocks, they have the same serial number pretty much all around the gun. Uh, it's on the frame, it's on the slide, it's on the barrel. However, sometimes the frame would have an extra US one on some of the ones that were manufactured here, whereas the slide and the barrel wouldn't match those last two uh, letters. So make sure you're going by the frame on the handgun. That's, that's the serial number that matters. So wherever that is, um, somebody had some. Yeah, Trent, um, yeah. if you are denied for, for whatever reason, if it's, if it's just a simple mistake or, or for whatever reason you, and you got denied, if you're in that small percentage that gets denied, you can go back and, and um, re dispute the denial. So don't get, they, they're gonna deny a certain amount of people no matter what, but, they, but you can, if you have good cause and it's just, you can go back. I've had, I've had a few friends who freaked out that they got denied on their original um, uh, two-year license and on renewals. I had a guy that carried for six years that got denied on a renewal and it, the, he went back and asked him, Hey, why am I being denied? I, you know, look at, here's my letter again, please. You know, and, and immediately he was, he was uh, approved for the renewal. As far as your initial license, I had, a, I had one, you know, a couple guys get denied and they went back and they uh, disputed it and got denied. I've, I've never had anyone other than someone who had a clear reason that they shouldn't be even applying, get denied. Ernie, you got anything? Uh, no, everything that, that Brett said was spot on. The only thing that I would add um, if you are uh, on medication, because uh, it may come up in an in interview or conversation, uh, if you are on any medication um, that is of mind altering quality, uh, then that might actually uh, hamper your ability to get the CCW. I, I had one client in particular, um, by all accounts, he would have gotten the CCW, you know, easy. Uh, but uh, he is on prescription medication for, I believe, back pain that, um, I don't know, I remember what it is, but uh, uh, alters his state of mind. So they denied him, not on anything, uh, you know, bad, but the fact that he was on medication on a regular basis that altered his state of mind. Right. Um, so this, you know, on your terms of license, uh, item six, can everybody see this? Let's zoom in a little bit. Yeah, you're good. Um, shall not carry a concealed weapon while taking medication. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't say prescription. It doesn't, it doesn't specify anything. Now, obviously, that was a very specific case, and there have been a few like that. Um, but keep in mind, if you ever have an incident, you know, if you ever end up having to draw your gun, you end up having to shoot your gun, and you are taken into custody, there's going to be a blood draw, and they're going to see, okay, well, what was in your system at the time of the incident? So keep in mind, you know, whether you're uh, pretty much anything that, that alters mood, alters psychological state, or induces fatigue. Uh, those are kind of the big three. Um, so understand that if you are, those of you guys that do already have a permit, those of you guys that are, that are pursuing it, keep in mind, if there is something prescription oriented, find out, you know, do some research on it. Have there been cases about it? Have there been civil cases about it? A uh, perfect example was I had a student who was on a, a blood pressure medication um, that had been linked to a couple civil cases where it had increased aggression due to some hormonal imbalances that it induced. That's something that they would absolutely look at. Uh, so it may not be a reason they may deny you, but it may be something you want to talk to your doctor about if you are, you know, serious about carrying a gun. Um, so if you have any questions about specific medications, obviously, you know, your doctor is the best person to talk to. Um, but if you would like to contact any of us, you know, We've had a lot of students, you know, talk about a lot of things that would be 100% in confidence if you choose to discuss it with us. And we can kind of give you whatever our experience is with, you know, people on that medication in regards to CCW. Um, Brett, Ernie, you good with that? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and if it, yeah, don't disclose anything that you don't want to uh, have to explain. <laughs> but you're supposed to disclose everything. <laughs> well, medication, um, I mean, medications, you I know. If you got if you had an injury, a shoulder injury or something like that, and you're, and, and uh, 
and you're fresh, you know, you're taking Norco, whatever they prescribe. That's not, that's not something you're gonna be taking for a long time, or at least you better not be. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, pres temporary prescriptions are, are, are okay not to mention, if you will. It's, right. They want to know if you're taking anything longevity wise and so forth. Right. So what I'm speaking to more on that is, is once you are, once you have your permit, once you're carrying a gun, be mindful of, of, of kind of what you're taking. I mean, even NyQuil can throw you off enough that you don't realize you're thrown off, you know, yeah, so you, check, check that kind of stuff. If you have to ask yourself the question, should I be carrying right now with this one I'm taking? You've already answered your question. That is no. Yep. Um, so this is all the documentation you'll need to submit. Uh, the one that you don't necessarily have to have in hand uh, is your training certificate. They don't require you to have completed your training prior to application. Uh, so just so that's clear, you don't have to have done your training. Uh, once your good cause has been approved, then they'll let you know and prompt you, hey, you know, you can go out and take your training. Uh, but the sheriff's department doesn't put the responsibility on you to go out and take a training class and then end up getting denied because they're also not going to reimburse you for that. Um, but all the required stuff, um, the residency documents, the government issued photo ID, this is all stuff you, you should have scanned or have in PDF form to add uh, here, okay? And then you'd select your permit and submit. So pretty straightforward. Um, any questions on anything we've talked about so far? Uh, Mike, we got anything in the... Oh, Ernie, what's up? Yeah, would you mind scrolling down a little bit to where the signature block is? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you do your signature, you have to use your mouse to mimic your, your signature there. It's going to come out atrocious, um, like bad. And it's not going to be uh, something that you like. However, if you go in clear form like Trent just did, it's going to erase everything that you've done above. <laughs> so if, first of all, be okay with it not looking right. Second of all, if you want to redo your signature, there is a little button just above on the top right of the box that says retry. Before you go hitting buttons, make sure that you are on retry so you don't clear everything above and have to start over. That is probably the second biggest complaint on Permidium. The first one is somebody accidentally hitting the back button. <laughs> yes. so, uh, Mike, have they had uh, the same problems with it down in San Diego, the same complaints? You know, we've only had Permidium for a couple months, so I don't think we've gotten this deep, but I'm definitely going to steal that as a tip because uh, that could be enormously frustrating. Yep. And, and just about everybody that currently has a permit has probably done it at least once. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's just, just a reality of, of, of the electronics here. Um, same thing if you hit refresh. Sometimes it'll populate everything. Sometimes it won't. It generally will not. Um, so let's talk about your good cause. Um, the first thing I want to say about this, and, and the, other, the other instructors are, are absolutely going to have a lot of input on this. Uh, this is what we're going to spend you know, a good amount of time on. Um, the rest of this stuff is kind of just logistics. Your good cause is really where it all happens. So number one, they're not looking to deny people, but they will make you back up everything that you claim. So best piece of advice I have for you is less is more, okay? Uh, people that give three different reasons. I carry large amounts of cash and I work in a shady area and I go hiking. Well, they're gonna want proofs for each one of those items. Okay, where do you work? Why are you calling it shady? Uh, what is large amounts of cash? We need to see bank statements going back six months, a year, maybe even longer. And then you go hiking. Okay, let's see some photos of you out on trails. You know, let's see saved hikes that you've done on your on your app that you use or whatever it is. Um, so whatever reasons you give, you will have to back up. And a denial of one of those reasons, technically speaking, I'm going to hedge on this, a denial of one of those reasons may result in a denial of your whole application. But generally speaking, the investigators who are not supposed to be helping you with this stuff uh, will say, hey, this one's kind of iffy. You might want to take that off your off your application and maybe focus more on these. Okay. They will also say, hey, the way you have it phrased is this. You may want to phrase it a little bit more like this. Okay. Um, the other piece of advice uh, is you really you have to be careful about anything that you use in regards to your employment. Uh, probably one of the most common things uh, that I would see, especially with people in the medical field, uh, is doctors and nurses, and they'd say, well, you know, we get attacked by patients. Well, if it's inside the hospital, that's not really, you're not in public. That's the, the responsibility of your employer and you to figure out how you're going to guarantee your safety while you are at work. 
Um, so saying that, oh, well, I've been attacked by patients or something like that, you know, I work in a psych ward, that's not going to fly. But for people to say, well, I've been attacked in the parking lot, walking to my car outside the hospital because a meth head thought I had access to drugs, that's absolutely a viable reason. And they may say, okay, well, how can you back that up? And I've had students go out and find two news stories of that, that exactly happening to doctors and nurses in a parking garage, and boom, they were approved. Right. Sure, what you got. Yeah, so if you acknowledge or you, if you, if you um, make the suggestion that you were attacked in a public area, and you did not report it or do some sort of reporting, you are now going to be in question of why, oh, the first thing, why didn't you report it? Well, if it was that bad, why do you think you, why, you know, why do you have to carry a gun now? If you don't report it, it's, I would not suggest you, so you put that in writing down that you were attacked somewhere and you did nothing about it. Um, yeah. So let, let me clarify now what I'm speaking about is more, you are at risk because you're in a situation in which other people have been victimized similarly. Okay, absolutely what Brett's saying is 100% correct. You know, if, if you were ever attacked, you should be able to cite the police report and everything else that happened as a result of that incident if you're going to bring it up. The um, county, the location, what time of day it was, all that should be documented because if, case in point, if you get pulled over while you're every CCW, and you don't and, and you don't re, and you don't report that. You know, why did I? I didn't nothing happen. You know, I got attacked over here, but I'm not gonna report. I got I got uh, pulled over. So they're gonna they're gonna question why you're not uh, um, why you're not reporting stuff like that. So so if you don't have proof of it, and it happened, even though it happened, don't even don't even put it on there because they're gonna ask you for proof. Yep. Um, so, you know, uh, hiking, driving around the state. You again, what I wanted to focus on was was the employment thing. A lot of people, you know, they they don't really want to get their employer involved in the process because generally there's kind of a you know anti gun environment in a lot of workplaces, especially big workplaces. Um, so while you're at work, your safety is kind of the, the the responsibility of your employer or yourself. It's not really about having to have a permit and carry out in public. Same thing when you're at home. When you're inside your home, you can carry a gun anyway. So saying, well, I'm, I want a CCW for home defense, that's not gonna work because you already have that right. Um, so you have to be able to articulate, and that's really what it comes down to, articulation, that you have a reason to carry a gun out and about, okay? Um, so hiking, I've had people cite coyotes because they hike out in Peters Canyon or in Silverado or you know Black Star, any of, these, any of these places, they just go out and recreationally hike and they can show a couple of photos and they're worried about coyote attacks and they go and find a couple news articles in Orange County of coyote attacks within the last two years. OCSD will take that, no problem. Um, as long as you can back it up with the fact that you actually do those things. Uh, I've had people you know, go and, and do RV trips to state parks and national parks and they stop in rest stops on the way or they stop in parking lots where they can legally stay overnight and they wanna be able to, to have their gun. Perfectly fine, as long as they can document as long as they can can defend it. Um, so Ernie, what you got on uh, good cause statements? Um, so I agree to an extent that less is more. Uh, be uh, succinct and direct with your, your good cause statement. Don't make it 10 pages. Um, but at the same time, don't go on a rant in your CCW and go off on a tangent and say, hey, um, I work in this neighborhood and I have to tr travel during hours of darkness, early morning, late hours. And I see a lot of people wearing hoodies and looking at me funny and whatever. And it makes me scared. Like I've seen that come across my desk and that's not something that you want to capitalize on. You, you, you're on the right track with, Hey, I go to and from my place of business, uh, during early morning hours or late evening hours. And I'm concerned about my safety as it is in an industrial area or not well lit area, whatever, right? And, and you leave it at that. Uh, what you don't do is go down that rabbit hole of describing, you know, the would be attacker. Okay. Uh, so make sure that your, your uh, reasons are to the point and you articulate what is your concern with that potential threat, right? Uh, hiking, for instance. You know, you go hiking at Peters Canyon or wherever, um, and, you know, uh, during early morning hours, late hours, whatever, and there have been encounters with coyote, mountain lions, whatever, uh, and I'm concerned for my safety against, you know, potential wildlife attacks, right? Stuff like that. 
Um, as it relates to your employer, if you're on good terms with your employer, then play the employer card. Uh, a lot of times, while you may not carry large sums of money, uh, a lot of people have access to uh, sensitive information, which gets overlooked. So if you work in an office and you happen to be the HR person or the accounting person, you probably have access, um, whether it be on your laptop, your phone or whatever, access to sensitive information like uh, employees or clients, banking information, address, date of birth, social security, all that stuff. You have access to it. That is just as uh, important, so to speak, as carrying cash. So if you have access to sensitive information, capitalize on that. Uh, so for instance, if you're a financial advisor and you have a laptop that has all your clients' information on it and that laptop uh, gets stolen, that would be a bad day or somebody uh, attacks you for that laptop, also a bad day, you could use that. Yeah, and I'd like to chime in too um, on what Ernie is talking about. And not only does it does it apply to the worlds that Ernie was referring to, but it also applies to um, co contractors, construction workers, people that are carrying tools and and, and other uh, equipment that is constantly stolen. Um, it, so if you have a tr if you're driving if you drive for a company and you go pick up a work truck daily, you know that work truck, Snap-on tool guys, uh, Mac Mako tool guys. Um, anybody that's carrying anything of value, um, you know, uh, anything under nine hundred dollars now is not considered. Is now considered. Um, uh, yeah. So anything above that is good. I mean, so you can have your boss's tools, and God forbid, if you probably if you got your boss's tools stolen, he's probably going to fire you uh, because you were something happened. So there's a lot of good simple reasons. We tend to overthink this part of the application more so than anything. And this is where you can call out, call any one of us, and, and we'll talk to you about this. You don't have to come train with us you know, or anything like that. We'll 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 talk talk to you about this and give you some bullet points to uh, start your letter on. And that's one thing I always tell tell my students too. You know, when they ask me, "Hey, can you help me with a good cause?" Absolutely. First, just get some bullet points of what you think might be good reasons, and then we'll narrow. We'll take those reasons and we'll and we'll we'll, uh, we'll shrink it down to one of the top two or or, or maybe three, but you may not even realize, um, you know, you may not even realize why, why you should have one. You may think, no, there's no reason for me to have one. Well, we can talk to you about stuff and, and ask you questions um, outside of your second man right, of course, but we, we can um, talk to you and ask you questions that will then pull out information that you don't even realize you probably have that is a good, good for your good cause statement. And from there, we just build it on that. And we're not trying to make everybody, uh, um, you know, uh, crazy gun carriers out there. We want people to be responsible because it is, it is, it, it changes how you act and respond in public. You know, when you're carrying a gun, you, there's no more road rage allowed. You can't get, can't get, you know, crazy on the road. And if you're carrying a gun, I had a student of mine who had NRA stickers, Orange County gun owner stickers, Glock stickers, all these stickers on the back of his car. And, um, just so happened one day he wasn't caring and and he was getting on a freeway that was under construction and the on-ramp was a very very short on-ramp and he had to merge over right away and he cut some other guy who changed over from the, the the number the number three lane to the number four lane um and had to hit the brakes pretty hard next to another he, he, the guy was you know giving gestures and so forth well that guy who he cut off called the cops on him and said that he was carrying a gun and he waved a gun on him Okay. Now he didn't wave the gun at him. He didn't have his gun on because he got pulled over down the road. And the cops checked him out. And he didn't have his gun. He had his permit, but he didn't have his gun with him. But because of the stickers all over his car, the guy who, who got cut off unintentionally, he made a phone call and was pissed off. This is how pissed off people get on the road or stupid people act on the road. He made, he made a call, had this guy pulled over and they did a pretty much a felony stop on the guy and found it, you know, he didn't have his gun and, and, and let him go. I, and so just be mindful of what you're doing when you're if when you get to this point, um, what you care, or, you know, when you're carrying, what you're what you're expressing on your vehicle and, and, and around you. Just want to be mindful of all that stuff. So two things on uh, just to add on to what um, what Ernie and Brett said. Um, number one, when it comes to sensitive information in your possession or expensive tools, things like that, what you emphasize in your good cause statement. Um, is about how those items increase the risk to you, okay? Um, we're not gonna use our, you know, you're not gonna be, 
not I'm not gonna say anybody's gonna try to trap you when they're interviewing you or anything like that, but you're not gonna use your gun to defend property. You're using your gun to defend your life. So if somebody else puts your life at risk because of the property that you have, if somebody chooses to target you because of that property, then you're absolutely you know able to defend yourself. But that is a lot, that is one of the things that a lot of applicants get questions on. Yeah, you know, I've even had people say, Well, I'm a firearms instructor, I take three thousand dollars worth of guns to and from the range. Okay. And well, people see me, you know, people see me taking the cases out of my car. People see me doing whatever. They'll follow me home. They, okay. Well, again, it's about how they're attacking or how they would conceivably attack you. It's about how it puts you at risk, not because you're going to defend your stuff. So just want to, just want to tack that on. Um, second thing, this is just my own personal opinion. All hats off for a second. Um, if you're somebody who is sitting there going, I don't really know if I want to carry a gun because that's a lot of responsibility. That's something I'm, I'm not really sure I'm, I'm cut out for. You're exactly who should be carrying a gun. Okay. Because someone who, who approaches it with the level of responsibility and level of, of forethought and, and understands the weight of responsibility that it is, that's absolutely somebody's going to do the right thing. Um, and when it comes to, well, I don't know what I'm doing or I'm not really sure, you know, if, 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 I'm, if I have the skills to do this, well, that's what your training course is for, right? That's what going to Brett or going to Ernie or going to, you know, one of the great trainers out there, like that's, that's the purpose is, is to get, get that desire to be proficient, that desire to be responsible and give you the tools to do it. Yeah. Okay? And to, yeah, to follow up on that too, if you go through a class um, that's not, um, there's some, there, there's some class out there that'll fast track you uh, and you're not going to get all the legal terms. When you, when you, decide to carry full time you're you're literally putting up your entire life of uh to, to the responsibility of caring if you own property if you have a business uh, whatever the case may be you really want to know what the laws are out above and beyond what you're seeing here on that that trench moving over to show now there is a tremendous amount and you will have this will get your You'll be in the classroom just just kind of with your jaw on the ground saying, wow, these are there's so, there is a lot of responsibility, but you, but you should be asking yourself those questions. And like Trent said, if you are, then you should be caring um, because there is a lot of responsibility. You have to be a better person than who you are now. Um, and the laws are going to explain stuff and you're going to learn stuff like when you can, when you can't. Um, you may also have uh, friends that you in a circle that 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 you may not be able to drive with now because you're carrying a gun. So you got to be careful with that too. So, you, so there's, there's so much involved. So I, I advise you to take a, a, a solid CCW required class that the county requires and, and make sure you listen and absorb as much of the legal responsibility as you can because you want to know these things. Because you'll come across folks in the, that have their CCW like, oh, I went online, I was done in like three hours. Okay, great. That person could be very dangerous to, 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 to themselves. You're going to want to know what's, what, what's going on. And you're going to want to, two years from then, go back and refresh your mind on some, because you may have forgot some of the stuff of what you learned um, in the first initial 16 hour class. So that is this just a suggestion of mine. I know I'm pretty sure I can speak for Ernie and he feels the same way. And I know Trent does too. Um, it's very important for you to know, know, all the ins and outs, because if you're ever involved in a shooting, there's going to be two cases, your legal, your legal case, and then your civil case. Um, chances are, you're probably going to survive the legal case without any problem, but the civil case, that could be, that could be a whole different outcome um, in the, in, in this situation. So just be prepared. There's great insurance companies out there as, as well that we can go into later on, but uh, just know that you're making a, a very strong, strong minded decision to carry. Ernie. Uh, no, I think uh, that was uh, spot on. I mean, a lot of the points, you know, we, we cover in the, uh, in the class in detail about uh, not being a, uh, well, a jerk when you're carrying uh, and, and taking the situation very, very seriously. So um, you're saying that before you, you leave your house, you are ready to give your life and take a life that day. And practice your draw. And practice your draw every day all right um so the again just kind of the, the final logistics and we'll open it up for questions um you know you you file your initial application um you may have an initial interview over the phone uh over zoom like we said 
uh, or over some kind of video chat. Uh, they've been connecting them pretty much whatever works for people. Um, from there, uh, you'll once you receive your what's called your conditional approval, that means your good cause statement is approved. Uh, it's conditional only uh, contingent upon you completing a training course. So once you complete a training course, they will give you a training certificate, uh, which you will then submit to the sheriff's department. And from there, they're just going to verify all the all the gun information matches, make sure that it came from an authorized training provider. Uh, the list is on the website here. So on the CCW license homepage, training providers will take you to here. Uh, all over the county and people teach uh, private courses, uh, regular courses. So uh, we're, you know, Brett's under uh, Apex. Um, where you at? Uh, Ernie's under Tap Rack Bang here uh, over in Orange. Uh, but, you know, we, both of us, you know, we host classes in different areas, make it work for people. So, um, sorry, didn't go back to the page I thought of that. Uh, some other things that you want to read through is the terms of your license uh, and the um, CCW license policy. All these kinds of things is absolutely all stuff that you want to read through so that you can, you know, be well versed in, in everything. They even have, uh, you know, CCW license holders and vehicles, how to handle law enforcement contacts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And just about every department out here now has, because CCW has been around for several years, They've gotten their officers up to speed on how to handle permit holders, you know, what permit holders have to go through in terms of the legal process and the training process so that everybody is hopefully on the same page. Um, so gents, anything to add before we open it up to questions? Uh, yeah. um, so a couple things, uh, if, and just throwing this out there, if you're walking away from uh, this briefing and you're like, holy cow, this is complicated, and you know you you want help one of the things that that we do uh is our, our we call our white glove ccw application uh so uh if you want uh, i will actually do your your application with and for you uh in a, in a consultation uh so i'll help you compile all the stuff I'll, I'll help you write your good cause statement uh, in its entirety we'll submit everything schedule your interview and everything uh and then on, on a side note if you have more questions coming away from this uh, we, all, we also offer more uh, an informal Q&A uh, uh, once a month for pre-CCW. So if you have questions about the CCW process, the whole thing in general, uh, we, we have that uh, as well. We have one coming up here in a couple of weeks. Brett, what do you have? Yeah, uh, no, like Ernie said, we both do that. And, and Ernie and I also uh, train together um, in, in, in different environments. I'll invite him out to uh, our, our training seminars and, and, and our classes and, and, and vice versa. Um, you know, and I, advise, I, I suggest to people to, to train and train often. This is, a, this is your, your CCW permit. It's like your gym membership. We're the gym to go to, to continue training. This is a skill that you, I promise you, I don't care how good you think you are in here. Uh, if you haven't shot in a while, you're, you're not going to shoot well at all. And, you know, we, we constantly um, offer opportunities to keep those trainings up and you get diversified. You get, you learn a lot. We teach, we teach both Ernie and I, because I've, I've worked with Ernie on numerous occasions and still do. We, we pick each other's brains to also better, better ourselves to better uh, give the, that exposure to our, to our students, if you will. And most of our students are no longer students. They become friends. It's very intimate when we get in, when we start dealing with a life-threatening type of training. Uh, for those of you who studied different martial arts in the past, you know how that gets when you're that close in combat um, and so forth. And there's also hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat stuff that you can get into too to make space to where you can realize to make space where you can draw your weapon too. So I suggest that you you train you train often and you need to train with what you're wearing too. Don't go into a training seminar with a bunch of tactical gear that you only wear on that one Sunday a year that you go out and pretend you're doing tactical stuff because <clears throat> tactical training is completely uh, useless in my opinion, to a certain degree, I should say, in my opinion, um, in the CCW environment, because you're not going to have comms to, to, to radio somebody. You're not going to have backup. You're not going to have, you know, 200 rounds on you. You're going to have what you carry with. And if you don't train with what you carry with, what's the purpose? And, 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 there's guys that will put 30 guns on their, on their uh, licenses. That's great. But can you physically handle 30 weapons as well as you can one that you train with on a regular basis? No, I have a, quite a bit of handguns, but there's two that I carry. One's a Glock 26 black and one's a Glock 26 Brown. 
Okay, that's it. I train with that gun all the time. Some of my friends give me a hard time because I train with that gun all the time. You want to make that gun a part of you. You want to know what the trigger pull is like. You want to know all that stuff. And Ernie and I will, will get into that. And most of your instructors out there, if you're consistently training with them, will get into that whole thing and 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 have fun with it because it, it is fun too. It's challenging. It's it's a sport. Um, some days you're really good and some days you're really bad. So, you know, embrace it and uh, you might find a new passion. Awesome. Uh, does anybody in the lobby or anybody on uh, Facebook have any questions? Mike, do we have anybody out there? Yeah, Bob asks, he says, I live in OC, but my only reason for applying is for protection in my weekend home in San Bernardino, his desert home. Good causes mainly for San Bernardino. Is that acceptable? Okay. So I, I did send him a message. I saw that on the chat. Um, do, for other people that have a, have a similar situation, absolutely. You know, frankly, any travel in California, any frequent travel in California, you can use as, as your good cause. Uh, whether it's to a second home or whatever else, as long as your residency is here in OC, um, you can say, yeah, I go out there X amount of times a year. You know, you, what you'll probably have to do just from experience, you'll probably have to document that as your second home, if that's what you're going to say it is. Um, not that you reside there, but just that you own it, that you have a legal right to that property. Um, and that, you know, how many times a year you typically go out there and something to show for that. I've literally had people just give receipts from the gas stations they've stopped at, you know, so any, any of that is fine. Um Again, not necessarily that they're going to ask for it, but it's it's best to be prepared for, for the eventuality. Um, so yeah, it, it, again, you wanna, if it is your home out there, well, you can already carry a gun out there inside your home. So what you wanna document, what you wanna emphasize is is the travel. That's that's where you're you're more you know at risk, if that makes sense. Okay, um, Tom, Tom wants to know, uh, he says, does, any, does anyone know how backed up the OC Sheriff CCW is for renewals? In the past, a current CCW holder couldn't apply before 90 days of their expiration date. Could you could you go into that? We actually had a couple questions on, yeah. uh, you know, how quickly can you renew and how uh, how fast is the process right now? So right now, uh, you can start your renewal process within 120 days of your expiration date prior to. Um, so day 120 hits, you can start submitting. Now, check that it actually is 120 days because otherwise permitting them will bump you out when you try to submit. So make sure, you know, you got, got a little bit of wiggle room, but um, right now, you know, six months ago, they were actually a little bit behind right now. Uh, they're almost entirely caught up. Uh, so I've seen initial, again, this is anecdotal, you know, we don't have published data on this, but right now I've seen initial permits take about a month to a month and a half. Uh, I've seen renewals get processed once somebody has all of their stuff in as fast as a week or two. So um as far as I can tell, it, it, it is pretty much about as up to date as it's always been, if not a little bit more so. Uh, Ernie, what have you been um, seeing? Yeah, no, I mean, everything you said was, was spot on. Um, you know, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting. People are, are asking about how long does it take, you know, 120 days uh, from renewal and, you know, uh, three, four months uh, to, for new applicants. Uh, once upon a time, there was a 12 calendar month wait so you know it's it's come a long way in the last three years four years uh as far as as the process but um you remember you can do the process in any order you want you can go do your live scan you can do your training and then submit your application uh that'll be the the, the fastest way you can get through your your process however you run the risk of doing those things like the training and the live scan and, and if you get denied that's out the window uh, the slowest way to do it and the safest way as far as money goes is do your application. Then uh, they give you the conditional agreement that will trigger you to do your uh, a training and live scan. And then, and then you're done. Uh, but that will give you the longest. That'll, in this case, that'll give you up to about three months potentially. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah, it, 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 it absolutely has come a long way. Um, it just based on that too. Yeah. Real quick. So along the line with what Ernie is suggesting, um, also, what I've seen that works really, really well is you go and do, do all your applicational stuff and you get your interview, whether it's a phone interview or a live in-person interview. Um, what I have had people do, and I did this myself years ago, is immediately following my interview, um, I set up for the morning and I went in, did my interview um, and came out. Immediately following my interview, 
I went because right around where you were in Orange County, where you where the interviews conducted, are all types of places to get your live scan and everything else you need done. Um, done. So I went right after got those done, got home, uh, scanned them, emailed them in to the uh, investigator, and he was on his desk that same afternoon. Um, it shows a couple different things. Shows one that you're you're serious about it. Shows two that okay, you went through the interview, you felt good about it, and now you're sending them more information that they're going to need. And they want to see all that stuff. And the, the beautiful thing about the website is now is you can just upload things right to the website and goes into your file and stays there. So, um, so immediately after that, uh, they'll, they'll sign up for a training, which is the 16 hour class. And then they'll get booked on that. And then as the interview, pro I'm sorry, as the background process is going on, they already have the documentation that the investigator is going to need. And it's always going to be there for them. <clears throat> and then the investigator will go through it and send, send you emails and notes and saying, hey, I need this or you're good on that or whatever. And then you have your training set up and then your training comes and, and you do that. You sit, submit that certificate and you're helping them along the process. They're not going to hound you. They're not going to be knocking on your door and say, hey, Ernie, I need this. I need that. They're not going to do that. They're not here to babysit you. So just get your documentation. Be, be professional about it. I also suggest when you go in for your interview that you don't roll up in flip flops and tank, tank top and, and, and shorts. Go in there in a professional atmosphere, not necessarily a, 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 a tie, but you know maybe bi casual business attire and look like you are presentable because you're going into a police station anyways and you're going to be judged from the minute you pull into the parking lot to the minute you leave. So go in there looking like you, you fit the bill. Uh, so we got a couple of questions on the chat. I want to go through them. Uh, Valerie Starr uh, moved to LA County. Are the application requirements much different? So LA doesn't use permitium. Uh, so let me go back. Just to don't even room. apply. What's that? Just don't even apply. <laughs> so that <laughs> that is <laughs> that is a very frequent um, Ooh, a very frequent thing. Unfortunately, um, basically they will only be using this form. Uh, so you need to fill all of this out. Uh, now, all of this is very similar to everything you saw uh, on our walkthrough, uh, and we can't help you out with it, absolutely. But LA, the last I checked, has like 812 active permits in a city of however many million. So they are pretty much about as no issue as you can be without actually being no issue. They will still accept a good cause, but their definition of a good cause for LASD and our definition of a good cause for OCSD are very different. Um, so their filing cabinet. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, we can help you out with it, uh, and you know, I strongly, I strongly urge you to apply, even even though the possibility of denial is is pretty high, ninety nine percent. Um, but if it is something you want help with, we'll absolutely walk you through it. Um, but unfortunately, unless I, I've had people with active death threats, active actionable death threats that law enforcement isn't get investigating, still not get a permit. So. I, I don't I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, well, Valerie, if you have, want to us, I can I can help you out with it. You'll have better luck finding a realtor for <laughs> Buena Park or La Palma. That's yeah, that's a that's a <laughs> better better option. Um, so, Robert Amidi, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Someone moves out of OC, does that require turning in your CCW? Is it immediately invalid? Uh, and upon renewal of your permit, is it the same dive into a reason for need? So. Um, Two parts on that. Uh, in regards to moving out of OC, your residence is the basis for the issuance, typically. Um, so if you move within the county, you simply have to notify them within 10 days of the change, based, just like you'd notify the DMV that you're supposed to. Um, if you move out of the county and you were applying as a resident, meaning you were applying for a standard two year permit, that's what that verb is that you're seeing there means. Um, you weren't an out of business or out of county business uh, permit or something like that. Basically, your permit will expire within 90 days. So, yeah. And if you, uh, I've had people ask me, what if I hold on to my permit and it's still valid and I get into a shooting somewhere else? Nope. <laughs> it, it will not be valid because you moved out of the county. Um, so, uh, hopefully, that answers your first question. If there's something on that, just uh, feel free to follow up on the chat. Uh, as far as renewal, um, I don't want to say that the goalposts move because, again, they've been pretty consistent about the reasons that they issue. However, uh, due to some issues with some people's permits or some people's applications, sometimes they'll say, well, we need updated information. Or if your reason changes, if your good cause changes, you'll then need to find basis for that good cause. Uh, so best examples I've had is people that own their own businesses that require them to travel a lot. Well, 
then they apply for their renewal, but they're done. They're retired. Uh, they aren't working for that business anymore. So now they have to come up with a new reason. So there will be the same scrutiny into whatever the new reason is. But if your reason is pretty much the same, all you'll need to do is update the documentation, like large amounts of cash. You submitted a year of bank statements. Well, when you renew, you'll need to submit the most recent year of bank statements. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not really, you know, unless there's been an issue with, with your permit. What the frequent things I see on renewals when people get um, screwed up is when they fail to disclose something. Uh, so when they renew and nothing else has changed, but they got a speeding ticket six months ago and they don't tell the department and they get denied. You know, so it's it's things like that that throw hiccups into renewals, not so much the, the good cause reasons, unless somebody's good cause reason has changed. Um, so Robert, if that answered your question, um, great. If not, feel free to, okay, cool. I see you on video, awesome. Um, so down to Andy, I live in a city with a lot of coyotes. I can reference Facebook posts of people being followed and also had their pets attacked. Are we allowed to reference Facebook posts and how would we do it screenshots? So you can, but far more useful. Uh, so when I saw your question come in, I did this. Coyote attacks, Orange County 2020. These kinds of things, news articles, far more useful. Um, you can use social media posts and things like that as long as they have some kind of time and date stamp, but they're not as good as something like this, even though something like this is less specific to you. Um, so yes, you can reference stuff like that, but it's not really something to emphasize. And kind of a side question about your pets. Pets goes back to what I said about property. Um, you can't, you could hypothetically shoot an animal that's attacking your pet. Um, but if you were to say shoot a person that was attacking your pet, that is not going to be considered a justified shooting uh, because in the eyes of the law, pets are property. Uh, so it is essentially no different than if you shot somebody who was trying to steal your car, which again would be an unjustifiable homicide because they're not threatening you. Uh, now, if your child's in your car, totally different ballgame. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. I, you can use social media, but generally you want to use it, it, as much nonsense as the news articles, the news articles might contain they are a better public resource to use to back up the reasoning. So if you have a follow-up on that, feel free to um, uh, put it in the, uh, in the chat. Um, from Tom to everyone, be aware when you travel, your California permit is not good nationwide. So uh, just to pull up one of the resources here. What, what uh, we're talking about here is what's called concealed carry reciprocity. Uh, so, okay, perfect, Andy, awesome. Um, if you click now, just a little caveat to this, you can go to three different resources like this and they may disagree with each other. So do your research before you travel somewhere specifically. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on that. And then guys, if you got something to add, you know, I want you to jump in. Um, but if I click California, other states that accept a California permit or do not require a permit for non-residents to carry in their state um, will be the following. So you see the ones that say yes. So these states will accept a California permit like they would their own. Uh, others have some restrictions about do's and don'ts like maybe not state parks or maybe not county parks or something like that. Um, but generally um, use a resource like this, what's called a reciprocity guide. I'm gonna put that in the... Uh, in the group chat here. Yes, and I'm gonna spell it right. Um, CCW reciprocity guides, that's what you wanna use as a resource. So the NRA ILA publishes one, uh, USCCA publishes one. There's a bunch that are out there, but make sure you check. Um, secondly on that, when you are carrying out of state, be aware of the additional restrictions that may be on your permit, whether it's a non-resident or whether it's a state that allows non-residents to carry, um, just be aware. Like maybe they don't allow it in national parks. Maybe they don't allow it in their state parks. Maybe they don't allow it in certain circumstances. Maybe they do allow bars or don't allow bars. You, the, the onus of responsibility to know those laws is on you. So if you're about to travel somewhere, contact, you know, one of us, contact Ernie, uh, contact Brett, contact myself at, at OCGO, and we'll get you hooked up with resources that will tell you exactly what you can and cannot do. Uh, and most of them will be absolutely willing to send it to you in writing. Uh, Ernie, anything to add on that on reciprocity? Yeah, just an example. Uh, Utah, 
uh, so for instance, uh, Colorado and Utah. So let's just say you've got a California home license, Utah and Arizona non-resident license, and you roll into to Colorado. Colorado will, will certainly honor the Utah resident CCW, but will not honor the Utah non-resident CCW, which we would have, and therefore you cannot carry in Colorado. So that would be an example of what Trent was talking about, of uh, being knowledgeable about where you're going and, and if your permit applies or not. Uh, you can get hung up with saying, yeah, I've got a Utah permit and, and Colorado honors Utah, mm, non-resident does not. Yeah. And then other states that, that allow that do what's called constitutional carry, uh, kind of the, the colloquial term for it, um, where they don't require a CCW permit. Most of them only extend that to residents. Uh, so Arizona, for example, it really only applies to residents. Uh, South Dakota, state near and dear to my heart, they kind of just apply it to everybody because <laughs> South Dakota, South Dakota is awesome like that. Um, but always check. And this is stuff, the reason that these guys will disagree is because this is something that is changing on a continual basis. As for example, I know it's a little bit of a rabbit hole, but just to, to back up Ernie's example here. Uh, let's say Virginia requires a four hour class with a shooting component. So somebody has to fire some kind of course of fire, some kind of qualification. Well, then every state, generally speaking, that state legislature will say, well, any state that has this requirement or more will take their permit. Well, then Virginia changes their law to require an eight hour course with a shooting component. Well, now anybody that had less than that, now all of a sudden they won't accept their permit. So imagine 50 states all doing this. So this is why this is just a continually moving target that is, that's, that's always changing. Um, so make sure you, you are up to date, not, not only in other states, but also in our state. Uh, so when you travel to national parks, the rules may be a little bit different. When you travel on federal land, BLM land, or you know the Indian nations or something like that, be very cautious. Make sure you know what those individual areas, what their policies are. So with BLM land, you can contact the Department of the Interior Office. They'll tell you. Uh, with the um, you know with the sovereign states, the, you know the sovereign nations, the Indian tribes, contact their law enforcement agency. Ask them. You know, hey, what do I do? You know, if I've got a California permit, can I travel here in this area with my firearm? They will tell you. I would recommend to get it in writing. Um, <laughs> but you know. Uh, kind of go from there. But reciprocity is is one of those things. Um, so hopefully that answers uh, that question. Uh, Robert had a follow up. Double think, triple check uh, that they are not care. I assume you mean not carrying uh, when on airport property or whenever entering a courthouse for any purpose like a juror. Yeah, don't ever overlook that you're carrying your gun. Now this is honestly, it's a good and a bad thing. You know, I think most of us trainers would agree that your gun needs to be something natural. You know, it's not something you're freaking out that you're carrying a gun about all the time, but it's not really something you ever want to lose consciousness about. So absolutely know if somewhere you're going is a prohibited space. Um, so uh, for example, airports, um, if you stay inside your vehicle and your firearm remains concealed and you're picking somebody up at the airport, you're fine. The inside of your vehicle is technically private property. Now, if somebody sees your gun, you're going to have a problem, but if it's concealed, you're good to go. But the moment you get out of the vehicle and step on airport property, well, depending on who owns that airport, you may be in a world of trouble. Okay, so just be very cognizant of, of where you are and what the do's and don'ts are and be up to date on that. So use us as a resource, Orange County Gun Owners. If you have a good trainer, use your trainer as a resource. Say, hey, I'm about to travel here. I've never done it before. What do I do? You know, what are, what are the do's and don'ts? And it may be, well, you can't carry your gun then. Sorry, you gotta leave it at home or leave it locked up in the car. Car safe will work. Maybe a car safe won't work. Uh, big one is military bases. You know, people go on military bases for promotion ceremonies, you know, change of command, whatever else. They're celebrating somebody. Don't take your gun. Okay. Um, so, yeah, very, very good reminder on that. Uh, let's see. Guys, if you have anything to add, I'm. Yeah, there's there. also. Um... <clears throat> You know, you may find yourself um, coming from a long day at work and going out to dinner with some friends and whatnot. Um, one thing I advise is that you do carry a and have a safe in your vehicle. So if you decide to go and, and partake in some adult beverages, you can lock up your weapon properly. And that means separating the weapon from, and it's from, from its ammo. So have a lock box in your, in your, in your um, car so we lock it in and then the keys to that lock those in your glove box if, you're, if, you're, if your glove box has a locking mechanism on there 
because for you to, in order for you to get to that weapon would be very challenging and, and any and, and you don't want to run the risk of having your weapon on you and walking into a place that you're not supposed to have your weapon on you um, and you got to be mindful of that um, so yep. you need to prepare for any circumstances because you know there, there, there was a time and I learned this a long time ago I was at work and then I my wife set up arrangements for us to go out that night um, and I couldn't go because I had my gun on me. I had no way of locking it up in the car that I was driving. The car was open. There was no, nowhere to lock it. There wasn't a lock box. There wasn't a glove box. There wasn't anything. So I had to go home first and then turn around and drive back, you know, 30 miles to where I already had passed, um, and be an hour and a half late. So just, just be mindful of what you're going to do. We, and that's one thing you, you, uh, you get a lot out of here is, is you got a lot of experience between Ernie, Trent, myself, and the folks that you train with too. That's the beauty about it. You start seeing the same people that you're training with over and over. You start to uh, get to know them personally, and you also get to know about their experiences that they've had. So you learn from their experiences so you don't come across that crossroad and not know what to do. So take advantage of the people in the industry. You'll find out they're very like-minded um, and or you will catch up to that like-mindedness um, and, and enjoy it. Ernie, any final things? No, um, I think uh, Brett summed it up and you did, summed it up uh, just fine. Awesome. Uh, so Ernie and, uh, and uh, Brett's information is in the chat for those of you guys that could see it. Um, and if for whatever reason, you know, you, you reach out, reach out to us at info at orangecountygunowners.com and we'll get you hooked up with these guys or, you know, whatever resources we have to offer. Uh, both of them are great, phenomenal trainers. Um, but uh, yeah, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to answer them. We'd be happy to walk you through the process from an organizational point um, and uh, offer any, any help that we have, okay? Um, so thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, Ernie, Brett, thank you for your time. And um, yeah, have a wonderful night. Everybody stay safe. Take it easy. Hey, thanks, guys. Good night. Thanks, guys. Take care.